talk about here this afternoon is a little bit about spindle maintenance and repair. And I know that doesn't come across as the most, most sexy of titles, but I think when you look at it this way, as far as trying to improve your machine productivity by over 50%, that I think might be a little bit more sexy as far as what we're going to talk about this afternoon and some things that we can look at to get more life out of the machines. So why focus on the spindles? Why is that such a key part when we look at the overall productivity of the machine? Well, making parts all starts at the tool tip or the wheel edge for the grinding. It's a spindle that holds a tool or, or the wheel. And when the, machine, uh, the spindle goes down, that's it. The machine goes down as well. So how do we keep the spindle from going down? Where can we start? What can we look at? I'm going to go over some issues tied to vibration, issues tied to contamination, and also related to impact and collision. I'm going to handle these in reverse order as we go through here. So when we think about impact and collision, we're not talking about just the, the spindle heading the machine bed by accident or something to do with machine programming or things along these lines. These, of course, are, are pretty straightforward. But what we can get into, though, is also um, the spindle can be essentially have an impact or a crash even when we're not in the machining process, and I'll explain that here. For instance, I mean, these are real-world examples here. Mounting of the spindle. When you want to fine-tune the position of the spindle on the mount, uh, it, it, it's not usually good to, to go to this type of extreme. Uh, so we have to be careful on how the spindle is being mounted uh, so that we take, uh, take into account uh, not only about the spindle being hit or impacted this way, but also in relation to where we are with the bearings that are inside the spindle. This is key as well. The other thing that's tied to impact or collision is when we look at issues tied to uh, tool change. So what I mean by this is that um, we often see cases that come in for repair where you have a spindle going through automatic tool change and the spindle is not at a complete stop before a tool change is being actuated. So uh, what we want to be careful here is that um, this is an example of a, uh, the spinning draw bar uh, making contact with the stationary piston rod as it comes into eject the tool. So things you want to look at uh, in terms of your process is to make sure where things are in terms of the interlock with the zero speed control on the machine. This goes a long way to help uh, with, with this type of issue. We also want to check periodically for the condition of the solenoids in the machine to make sure that we don't have air, if it's a pneumatic type of, uh, type of spindle, so we don't have issues where that's leaking and applying pressure in the process because that eventually leads to this light contact. So that's something that we have to be careful with there. So those are a couple things tied to impact and collision that I think most people don't typically think of uh, when they think of uh, this hard contact to, to a spindle because those type of impacts and collisions are, are just as uh, serious and things to be wary of as you would be with just uh, you know an accidental crash itself. Another issue is spindle contamination. And this comes across in a lot of different ways. And it's not just about contamination to the spindle nose. Uh, there's contaminants that can come into the spindle and affect it in other ways as well, too. For instance, what about the back end of the spindle? A lot of emphasis, a lot of design and development is put forward where the, the actual business end of the spindle is, where the tool is, the, the, the nose of the spindle. But uh, a lot of times what happens is that uh, not so much protection is being given to the rear end of the spindle. And we find that a lot of oil, uh, a lot of dust, a lot of this can pool on the back. It can come and travel down the electrical cables and just pull on that and then it'll eat its way through into grommets and so forth onto the back end uh, of the spindle. So that's something that we have to be careful of and it's helpful to periodically uh, make sure that that's clean. We want to make sure how the uh, cables are being routed to the spindle itself to avoid such a problem or to even cover the back end itself. There are different approaches and things that can be done uh, to help along those lines. So again, when we talk about con contamination, it's not just about the front end. We can also look at coolant. 
Uh, coolant is another big issue that will limit productivity of the spindle uh, if it's not properly taken care of. Again, something that uh, comes across or sounds fairly straightforward, but this is something that we see all the time in terms of repair. Uh, what we want to do is if we can see some, uh, the contaminants that get into the, the cooling jackets. These become rusted, these become closed off, and uh, that's going to limit the cooling capacity and therefore the performance of the spindle. So periodically checking the coolant, making sure that it's clean. This is a picture here of a uh, pneumatic cylinder. This is a grease spindle uh, that somehow has oil on the pneumatic cylinder of its pistons, so, so not good. So how does that get in there? It's coming in through the air supply. So the other thing we want to check is the proper filtration level of the air supply that's going to the spindle, whether it be for the uh, uh, pneumatic release, whether it's for the air seal, what have you. We want to make sure that's at a proper filtration level because that as well is going to add and cause contamination to shorten the spindle life. As far as uh, the spindle of the front end, where a lot of people think of uh, typically in terms of contamination, um, sure, that's going to build up over time. It's something obviously you want to keep clean. This is kind of a worst case example. But what we see a lot of people doing when they're cleaning their spindles uh, over a period of time is they're using compressed air. And we always recommend that compressed air not be used when we're talking about the nose of the spindle because what's happening when you're using that compressed air, you're just driving those contaminants up deeper and deeper into the taper of the spindle and that's going to cause you problems and so forth and bad fit on the tools, issues with the grippers and, and so on. So we always recommend that instead that you use a vacuum and you put that off to the side and below and that'll draw it across and it'll keep it out of the taper. And just a simple thing like that really can extend spindle life by quite a bit. Um, the other thing as far as contamination uh, as far as the air seal goes is that uh, we recommend that that air seal be on not just during cutting but to also have that air seal on a little bit before operation and also for uh, two to three minutes after and that's just for the dust particles to settle that are in the air that, that follow your typical cutting process so that that isn't getting drawn up into the taper of the spindle due to convection so that's something that we see all the time as well as far as things that get uh, get sucked up into the taper. That's the typical reason for what's happening. And then vibration. Vibration seems to be this catch-all for, for explanation that people have issues with the spindles. You know, why did it fail? You typically hear just, well, due to, due to high vibration. Well, vibration is just an end result. It manifests itself in a lot of different ways and there's various things that you need to consider. So when we talk about shake, rail, and roll, we're not, we, we don't want to be like Elvis. We're looking for ways to keep that smooth as we can and to keep the process going. For instance, a typical repair or, or a spindle that needs service, you'll hear that the, uh, the bearings failed. Okay, now I did not list that in the three things that, that, as, as a topic today because again, bearing failure is typically an end result. It's not a cause or it's not a symptom. Uh, it's, it's basically uh, they're manifesting some other issue that's either related to the machine or with the spindle itself. So um, when, when you find issues with the bearings in a spindle, it's important to know which bearings. Uh, yeah, um, is it the front? Is it the rear? Is it both? That has a lot to do with how you can help to ex expand the spindle life uh, operating on the machine. Uh, for instance, if you find that primarily it's the rear bearings that are failing in an application, that generally lends itself more to a twin type of vibration issue tied to fixturing or mounting in the machine, uh, something like this. Again, I'm speaking in broad terms. If it's the front bearings, that can lead you to a different direction. Front bearings can indicate more related to a, a load-related issue, uh, something along those lines to be, to be cautious of. And of course, I mean, you can have overlap a little bit of both, but in generality, um, that's something that's important to clarify and, and to make sure that you know what's happening, what's going on with the spindles in your machine. Some tooling is more obvious than others, that the issues that people have. Um, whether you're, you're, you're cutting steel or even you're just cutting air, um, a situation like this is just, is just not a good thing.
Uh, this gets into the issues of natural frequency, uh, things like this that are just going to cause all kinds of problems uh, with the spindle and, uh, and just having a, a well-maintained setup. So uh, that's something to be wary of. And typically the rule of thumb that we go by is, as a recommendation is to take the tool diameter and figure the length to be about an allowance of five to six times that, uh, that shank diameter of the tool. And within that range, generally, uh, our recommendation is, is that you're pretty safe. Now you can certainly have tooling that's longer than that that can still work, that, that, that you can use. But then it's more important to be more careful about what speeds, what feeds, things like this. And whoever the provider of the spindle is should be in a position to be able to tell you what the safe operating guidelines are for those kinds of tools. And then that gets into issues of single tip tools and uh, odd, uh, odd helixes and things like this. So that all uh, comes into play as well. And then there's chatter. Um, Chatter, when you see it, it's, pro it, 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 it's pretty obvious. It's also pretty obvious when you hear it. Uh, it it's not, obviously, a, a, a pretty pleasant sound. But if chatter is detected, um, in the past, for the most part, you've got pretty experienced operators. They can kind of hear. They can know where they can fine-tune. They know where they want to be. But nowadays, I would say here in the last few years, I mean, you're talking machines now that get into torques that are over 1,000 newton meters, speeds that are over 60,000 RPM. There's a lot more variables that come into play, a lot of different tool holding methods. You have HSK, you have steep taper, you have tribos, you have heat shrink. It's much more involved uh, to, to, to just kind of just fine tune with your ear where you're going to end up uh, as the optimum for your cutting process. So. This just is just kind of the results of what uh, what we see when we come across the chatter, and this is the uh, the quill shaft in the spindle, and just give you some idea of of just how deep of fretting it you can get into, and it can happen pretty quick. It's not something that can just uh, take take place over uh, a short period of time. It can it can, uh, it can do a little bit of both. So. Uh, a good process that we've come across that we help with our customers with is an actual uh, a chatter analysis and trying to uh, go through a process called the tap test to basically find the ideal uh, place you want to be in terms of your speeds and feeds uh, to optimize your, your cutting operation and therefore expand uh, spindle life. So what's done with this tap test is you basically have the spindle static with the, with the given tool and then you basically are tapping it twice. You're trying to get an alignment on an x-axis and a y-axis for the machine, and then you enter this data uh, basically to, uh, as a resonance to find out where you're going to be in terms of stiffness and also in terms of a natural frequency. And then this is run through a, a computer di uh, process basically to create what's called a stability lobe diagram. And uh, I don't know if, if some of you have seen this before, but, but what you're trying to do is um, there are great differences of where you can be in your process that basically can save you productivity time by up to four to five times from where you might be today. So for instance, um, with the, uh, with the, with, you know, the, the, the machine operator method, I mean, he can get you to a point that you'll be uh, in, a, in a process where you won't be creating any vibration problems or any issues. But if we try to stay within this diagram, and what this is, is we're basically charting RPM uh, versus feed rate here, is that uh, we want to get to a point here. So we're safely under a, a vibration level that would be considered an extreme. And this will keep us within a, the given limits of what the variance can take and get you to a level that's, that's at least two to three times more than where you might be today. So, and that's, that's a pretty, uh, the equipment is pretty sophisticated, but the actual test itself uh, doesn't take that much amount of time. And the savings are tremendous. So, you know, the chatter, that's reducing the productivity, it's reducing the spindle life, and by using that process with the lobe diagrams, you can really optimize where you want to be for your different processes. And that's going to work for it's, your milling, it's going to work for drilling, and it's going to work for grinding. So 
all that comes into play to, to help to uh, increase the spindle life. And the bottom line is, is that the more spindle uptime you have, it's the higher productivity it comes across and it affects your overall bottom line.